I love, love, love AI, and I think it's going to do so many things uh, in this world. That's Henrik Wordlin, and he's on a mission to make it easier to launch new ventures. And we're deeply, deeply passionate about bringing more entrepreneurship to people. 60% of Americans say they'd like to start something, and only 8% do. Henrik has founded and incubated several unicorns, and now with AI, he's scaling himself so that he, or AI agents trained in his methods, can coach thousands of entrepreneurs each year. And the first thing he looks for in a founder is not technical acumen, but whether they're a great fit for their customer. And it's not writing the software, and it's not writing the ad copy. Like, in a lot of that stuff, we can do better with AI. It is about human connectivity. On this episode of Crafted, we'll hear how Henrik is using AI every day in his personal and professional life. He likes to talk to his agents like they're people. He gives them names and backstories and everything, and he pushes them to go beyond their first response. Okay, that's great. Now give me five ideas that is definitely illegal. And then you're gonna get something completely different, right? You know, or stuff that will definitely get you fired. Henrik's a very creative guy and got his career break at MTV pulling a stunt that he was sure would get him fired, but instead got him a huge promotion. He has an incredible track record and has a framework for everything. As the co-founder of Prehype, he's helped incubate Roe, managed by Q, and other top startups, and he's helped many corporations launch their own new ventures. Henrik's also the co-founder of Bark, which started out as a monthly Bark box of toys and treats, and is now a publicly traded company that just launched Bark Air, an airline for dogs. Too, like we have a champagne that's made for dog, which is kind of chicken broth based. We have a spa treatment. Uh, we have an in-flight entertainment channel with Squirrel. Like there's a lot of stuff going on. Welcome to Crafted, a show about great products and the people who make them. I'm Dan Blumberg, I'm a product and growth leader, and on Crafted, I'm here to bring you stories of founders, makers, and innovators that reveal how they build game-changing products and how you can too. Crafted is brought to you in partnership with Docker, which helps developers build, share, run, and verify applications anywhere without environment, confirmation, or management. More than 20 million developers worldwide use Docker's suite of development tools, services, and automations to accelerate the delivery of secure applications. Learn more at docker.com. And Crafted is produced by Modern Product Minds, where my team and I can help you take a new product from zero to one and beyond. We specialize in early stage product discovery, growth, and experimentation. Learn more and sign up for the Crafted newsletter at modernproductminds.com. You've written a book, you've read, you're writing another book right now, you have a lot of methods and frameworks that help you build great products, and I know you're turbocharging that right now with AI with a goal to launch 10,000 startups over the next couple of years using AI to apply your, your method. Maybe we could start with what is the method, and then let's talk about how AI is, uh, is in a place today where it can do it at hyperscale. I think the method is obviously ever-changing as we learn new stuff. I think um, the reality is that there are different schools of thought when it comes to building companies. So, you know, some people kind of follow the way that they are taught at uh, Harvard Business School. Some people um, are into the kind of the Gary Vaynerchuk hustle kind of like uh, philosophy. Some people like the lean startup. Some people listen to all the YC stuff. And so uh, our specific flavor is based on the core thesis that you need to identify a customer that you'd like to serve. And then you have to identify a problem that they have. And so those are our two starting blocks. And then from that, we really have a lot of different tools, methods uh, for trying to figure out if that problem is real, how you can reframe the problem, how you can test if the, the problem resonates, and so on and so on. I know you talk a lot about customer founder fit. Can you explain what that is and why it's so critical to you? Yeah, I mean, like for us, um, and specifically in the age of AI, one of the things that becomes most important is what we refer to as relationship capital. So the last mile between the customer and the entity that they work with. And we, for things we can go into, thinks that that's going to be incredibly important, um, but also in an interesting way, easier to do. Uh, customer found a fit for us is that you really need to find and individual or affinity group that you really care about, that you understand, and that you can be bothered serving for the next 10 years. And if you don't do that, there'll be all these other issues that's kind of like emerge uh, later on in your, in your journey. 
So you, you alighted on dogs. How does it feel to be thinking about their happiness 12 years later? I mean, like, it's wonderful to think about dogs every day, and it's <laughs> wonderful to interface with people who love dogs, you know, as, as much as their children, because it just brings so much joy to the day. Um, I met Matt and Carly, and uh, the kind of the original story of Bark was about Matt and his dog, Hugo, uh, who was this great Dane living in New York City that didn't really have a a lot of places where it could go and find cool stuff to to play with. And so um, the the patient zero, if you like, was Matt and and his dog Hugo. And that became really the Custer founder fit narrative that we built the whole business around. Can you share more of how you launched BarkBox in its early days and what some of those early experiments were that proved that there was, you know, a huge opportunity here? Yeah, it was relatively simple. Uh, Matt and I have been brainstorming about new things to do, and we came up with this not necessarily very brilliant idea that we'd like to make a, a box with stuff for, for dogs. And so um, I built a little prototype, I think, because English is not my first language. I called it Doggy Baggy. Uh, and uh, I basically built like a, a WordPress template with like a rendering of what this might look like. And we went down to the dog parks and kind of showed it to people. And a bunch there was like, hey, this is really cool. I'd like to sign up when it's ready. And we're like, we have Square on our phones, so we can just take your money right now. And so I think the first 70 accounts or something like that was just us running around showing this non-functional website to people and, and, and taking the money on the spot. Yeah. And later on, like we, we now that in, in the pre-hype context and the incubation process, we call that signal mining. And it's now like kind of a pretty uh, evolved and, and uh, important part of the journey for all the companies that we're launching. Yeah, share, share more about signal mining and, and how you get that. Because what you got at the dog park was you actually got actual money people truly made a real commitment. It wasn't like, let me know when it's ready and it's hypothetical. And like people, people will tell you what you want to hear oftentimes, but you know, you, you, you found ways at the dog park, but also many other ways with many other products to prove that there's a real intent. And I'd love, I'd love to share more of how other people in, in whatever their context is can apply this technique of signal mining. You are uh, spot on. Like if you give people kind of wake, wake questions, they'll give you kind of abstract answers back. And so I actually find it to be one of the biggest risks for entrepreneurs is that they ask friends about an idea they have and nobody likes to be mean. So most people go like, oh, that's a great idea. Like the world need another dating app or whatever kind of it is that people come up with. And the problem I think for an entrepreneur is not necessarily that we spent investors' money trying stuff because I think that game is pretty established. I think what the risk really for an entrepreneur is that we spend a bunch of time on stuff that's just never going to go anywhere. And so signal mining for me is about trying to understand how do I extract as many meaningful signals as I can to where this concept that I'm uh, talking about is resonating with customers? What, what what do they actually like? And the best way to get real intent is what we call the swipe, which is basically that you ask them for real money. Because the second that you ask them for real money, they'll go from like, oh, that's a great idea to yeah. tell me again what this is including. Yeah. You said $25 a month and, you know, da 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 And so um, we have all these different uh, tools that we use to try to really understand a, a customer's uh, intent. Uh, uh, how well they understand the problem as we are kind of articulating it, how much they like the idea, the thesis of how we're going to solve it, and then also things like you know the price point and the business model around it, and so that uh, you can get to a point where the thing you go to market with has a good chance of uh, of resonating. So. I can't believe I'm saying this, I can't believe you've done this, but you, you just launched an airline, you just launched Bark Air. I'd love to understand if you saw that coming back when you founded BarkBox, first of all, and second, how did you prove that there was the true opportunity here to do something as capital intensive as launch actual planes flying in the actual sky with you know dogs as the, the number one customer? I mean, the interesting thing with Bark, and I think in the spirit of what we spoke about earlier about customer founder fit, is that we've always been in the business of making dogs who love dogs happy, right? And and so we talk about happiness for dogs and their people. Um, and so the next extension for our business was always 
kind of following that vision, not necessarily following the utility we provide. And that's, I think, is important kind of like mm -hmm. distinction for me because a lot of people, when they hear you make a box for dogs, the, the first question they ask you is when does cat box or hamster box or reptile box kind of appear? Because I think that was very historically how businesses were running. They, they understood how to do one thing and then they did that in many different verticals. Uh, we have always believed that we're more Disney for dogs, and so we follow the dog and it's human and then wanted to do products and services for them. And so even from the first pitch deck, we always had in there that we wanted to make m products and services, not necessarily airlines, but the airlines is something that we've spoken about at least publicly for the like six or seven years. And so it's not like a new idea. Now, we have worked with airlines, we've worked with uh, kind of couriers, shipping companies, and we've tried to kind of solve this problem in so many different ways, which was very angered in my co-founders, Matt, like very uh, obvious problem was that he had a great day and then he was going for Thanksgiving in Chicago every year and had to drive there with his dog. It's a big dog, right? And I have a lab, you know, like, and I want to bring her sometime to Europe to go on some holiday and I don't want to put her in cargo. But, and at one point we are just like, no, this, this should have to happen now. And so um, met another colleague of mine uh, who had a lot of experience doing airline stuff and basically uh, said, hey, you know, I think we can do this. And so to your question about signal mining, we, you know, I made the first website on, on Shopify and then, um, and then we had like one kind of destination, which I think was New York, uh, L.A., and we started to sell tickets there, and we the first plane was a chartered plane. And so, if nobody would have signed up, we you know, would not have to pay right. because it was a chartered plane. And then then it became widely successful. And and then now like uh, we have we fly Paris and London and all these different places, and I sold out many months ahead. And so now that we can we can really like plan and and optimize for it. Yeah, and you also make incredible videos. <laughs> Introducing Bark Air. Finally, dogs will fly the way they've always deserved to. First. If you think this is a joke, you're not a dog person. Bark Air, a 100% totally real airline for dogs. So your dog, you went to the Olympics last week. Uh, what's the experience for the dog? Yeah, I mean, like the experience really um, designed to be kind of starting from the moment you sign up. And so we will call you up and understand your dog, figuring out it has any specific interest, what it likes. And we're pretty detailed. Like, you know, we'll ask what kind of music it likes to hear on the car ride on the way to the airport, if it if it likes to ride with the window up or down. And, and so like we're, we're pretty specific with these yeah. kind of things. And then when you come to the airport, um, we have a little pre-meeting kind of uh, event or, or area where the, the dog can meet the other dogs. And then on the airline itself, I mean, like there's a lot of stuff going on too. Like we have a champagne that's made for dog, which is kind of chicken broth based. We have a spa treatment. Uh, we have an in-flight entertainment uh -huh. channel with squirrels. You know, like there's a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> it's a dog's life. It's a dog life. And of course, we help with all the kind of the practical stuff of like what kind of paperwork do you need and all those different things too. How are you taking these techniques that we're talking about now, and you've launched Autos, which I'd love for you to describe, and taking these methods in, you know, at hyperscale with, you know, thousands and thousands of startups you're looking to launch over the next couple of years? I mean, like over the last 15 years, we've built probably two or three companies a year. And obviously, in order to get two or three companies to kind of materialize, you need to mix them all. Um, and so we're getting pretty good of meeting a founder and then trying to understand what is the best company to build for them. What's a little bit unique, I think, with our approach and the way that we've done stuff at Prehype is that we never raised money for the, ho the holding company, the studio. And so where other studios were very much optimized to take people in and then kind of make them ready for a seat round. We were more into the spirit of, hey, let's figure out what is the right venture architecture for you as an individual. And so you might want to build a nonprofit or you might want to build an agency or you might want to build, you know, a one person uh, profitable business so you can have a more untethered lifestyle or you might want to build a unicorn. So what we do is find a person 
find what problem, find what uh, customer that they'd like to serve and find the problem and then go through that. And that took two or three months to do that. And the output was often be something we call the lean product plan or a sort of plan that articulated the idea and the market and a little bit of this, the sizing of the opportunity. And so when we got access to OpenAI in 2020, we were, we were like blown away and we're like, hey, wait a minute, all these kind of activities we do, many or most of them can probably be replaced with AI. And if we can replace us with AI, then we are able to help not just a few people a year start something, but hundreds if not thousands of people a year. And we're deeply, deeply passionate about bringing more entrepreneurship to people. 60% of Americans say they'd like to start something and only 8% do. And so we feel there's like this whole kind of like gap of people who have the insight, who have the capacity, who have the passion, but honestly, they just don't know how to, or they don't have access to capital, or they don't know how to code, or they don't know any things. And so what Autos is, is our attempt to try to take 15 years of experience in building companies, codifying it with AI, and then make it available to everybody. With the dream, as you're mentioning, to build hundreds, if not thousands of companies a year. And how are you doing it? I mean, like, uh, if you go into autos.com, there's a bot that is the front end to a lot of different autonomous agents, mm -hmm. and it will go through the process of identifying a user group, and then it will brainstorm different ideas with you. And then at the back of that, it will make you a plan, design a logo, it will design a name, it will come up with a tagline. And then it's going to start to build an AI for you that sort of becomes your co-founder that can help you with things like um, interview people and make a uh, product roadmap or um, scale uh, talking to customers through Instagram DMs. And then it can help you build the product and then it can help you make ads and then it can help drive traffic and then slowly it can basically take you from, from zero to 100 customers. And what are some of the interesting ideas that are coming through that people are starting to launch businesses around thanks to Autos? I'll give you some uh, concrete examples, but I mean, like in abstract, it's fascinating when you allow people who are not your cliche type of founders yeah. to suddenly express their problems, right? You know, you have um, people who are getting divorced and need to figure out what the process is for taking their spouse to court. Uh, you have tree trimming people who need help managing their business and um doing AI-based um, pricing of a product. You have um, um, people who have kits with handicaps that need that. You have, you know I mean? Like, it's literally from the 14-year-old to the 80-year-old, and it's across the gamut of location and and uh, social groups and, and all those things. And so, I mean, like, we probably get, I don't know, at this point, 50, 100 new people coming through a day. And so the the concepts are, are wild. Yeah, and I, I know you've talked about you want to see more donkey corns launched. What's a donkey corn? Uh, I fundamentally believe that AI is going to really change entrepreneurship. And, and in my kind of like positive headspace, it's for the better. Um, I think that you can now build companies much faster and much cheaper than you've ever done. And so donkey cones for me is this belief that we're going to see many companies that are going to be a few people that's going to be profitable. And so for us, the specification of a donkey cone is a $2 million turnover business that is operated by two people yeah. or less. Uh, they, they party like unicorns, but they grind like <laughs> mules, and thus the name <laughs> donkey cone. And I think, you know, I believe, I think it was um, Sam from... Uh, from OpenAI, who mentioned in an interview recently that he expects to see a unicorn with one person in the relatively short future. And I very much believe in that. And so as we are building this new operating system for building companies, we hope that we will see a bunch of people um, who are not just looking for unicorns, but they are looking to build a specific business from a very specific yeah. audience with a very specific problem. 
And then what we hope to provide them is all the stuff that they don't know how to do. And what they should provide is the inside and the humanity and the uh, caring about the yeah. customer. And you're also talking about a different way of building a company that probably does not require, in many cases, venture capital. Right. If you only need one or two people to build the thing and it can be as profitable as we just talked about, like, why would you raise VC? Exactly right. And I think, you know, we I think one of the things that is daunting on a lot of VCs is that the VC industry is probably up for a bit of disruption too, because you're gonna have all these companies coming from everywhere and you might not have them all be like venture scale, right? You know, if you're a trimming guy building software for other tree trimmers, then that might not be venture scale. Now, my contrarian view is that people said that about dog toys also, right? And then <laughs> we went public. Uh, so I think um, I think there is also, what I'm sort of looking forward to is how many of classic VC kind of like truisms mm -hmm. are going to turn out to be untrue. Yeah. Um, and, and I think by allowing a lot of people to make a platform and using AI to invest in them, uh, we are hopefully going to find a great deal of founders that can be very successful, but in a different way that maybe success have looked in yeah, the Yeah, well, and there's also a, a very different market now than there was a bunch of years ago. And so, you know, unit costs matter a lot more than they used to. So I, there, there's also that factor to whether or not you, like profitability is actually kind of a thing again. Right. <laughs> God forbid we're making money, huh? <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you you build something and you sell it for more than it costs to build. That's like that's a thing again, I guess. I don't know. It sounds weird, but do you think it's a thing? <laughs> Seems like a no novel idea. <laughs> um, we've talked about the entrepreneurs who are coming in, but but tell me more about how you're building Autos and how you've, you said there, there's a whole variety of agents behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, like the way that I look at most of the work I do with AI, uh, being it in the companies that I'm involved with or with autos is to just map my own workflows and then atomize them. And so just really look at what is the in point and what is the out point of any action that I do when I do any other workflows. And then I look at ways to put an agent to do that workflow and I define these in and out points. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of like how I compute most of the things. Um, and sometimes AI won't, are not able to do it. And, and they're in like a little bit of a weird mind twisty way. I then think it's humans as agents. And so for example, uh, the autos platform, if it reaches a problem that it can't do itself, we will hire developers on, uh, on online marketplaces mm. to do that on the behalf of the agent. So the, the agent will hire a human uh, to do the work that it doesn't know how to do. The whole process is just a, a string of prompts that delivers inputs and yeah. outputs. And then when you string them all together, then you get like the workflow that is very similar to the workflow that we've been doing for the last 15 yeah. years. And I, I mean, I'd love to hear more about how you figured out the right prompts that work. This is a big focus of your, your podcast, Beyond the Prompt, where you help people get beyond beginner mode uh, when they're using AI. So what, what are some of the things that you've discovered, whether for, in your personal life or as you're building autos that help you get beyond beginner mode and you know, get more advanced prompts that deliver better responses? For me, it's one of the biggest insight recently is that I think of these bots as people. I think in many ways, Google have obviously served us well for 10 years, but it also created a very specific be behavior of how we do stuff. You go in and we search something and we just enter, and then we expect yeah. kind of like thing to come. We're working with Launch and Anchor module, obviously it's much more of a conversation. And the more that I personify these agents, the more I become better of using them. You know, they just perform as they will perform, right? But, but if I give them a name and I give them a backstory and I give them kind of like a way of working and maybe a specific tonality and how they write and all mm -hmm. those different things, then, uh, yeah, like I just, it becomes easier for me to communicate with them because I replicate more how I would, would work with a human. And so I think uh, the way that I discover these prompts is in dialogue with these uh, agents, not necessarily where I just sit and craft a specific one, but more where I go like, hey, I'm trying to do this. Um, 
could you ask me a few questions so we can kind of like tease out what is the the, the thing I'm trying to achieve, mm -hmm. and then afterwards let us kind of figure out what the best prompt would be. Like, so I I would literally have this conversation with with an LLM. This is actually getting very recursive. So you're ask you're 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 asking the LLM to give you a better prompt to prompt it with. Am I getting this right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ask it to interview yeah. me. Just saying, hey, I'm trying to achieve this. What would what what do you need to know? Yeah, and then, the and world, then it's going I, and hiring a human <laughs> somewhere on the other end. That's my head's exploding I a bit. I mean, yeah. like, it is very, very fascinating. And the weirdness is that it's not that complicated to work with it. I think people are probably much more scared about it mm -hmm. than they should be. And I would also say I think a lot of the wrong people are working with it. Like, I, I feel there's a little bit of, like, a culture war going on when it comes to cre creative people and these things. Like, a lot of people are kind of scared. They'll take that job, and I understand that. But also, I'd like more of the creative people to use yeah. it because, you know, average in, average out. And, and the people that I was hoping would be prompting these things would be more quirky, interesting people that have a soulful observation than the McKinsey consultant that's looking to make things faster and cheaper. And so uh, uh, I'm kind of yeah. like uh, both excited to use it like that, but I'm also kind of excited for more people to use it yeah. like that. What are a few other practical tips? Like I want to get really down to it that because you've, you've talked to a lot of people on your podcast and you've done a lot of work yourself with AI. What, what are a few more practical tips beyond, first of all, pay for, don't use the free version of, of, of GPT, right? But what are, what are a few more beyond that? Um, I think the one that we hear consistently is that start by using it for private projects. So if you're a runner, have it help you plan your running kind of workout routine. If you want to go traveling, do that. If you're knitting or golfing or whatever, like use it for something personal first because that's much easier and you don't kind of have that much risk. I think that's probably uh, the first. Um, my my co-host, uh, Jeremy Otley, uh, who's a professor at Stanford and who spends a lot of time with AI, he has like a post-it note on his screen where it says, have you tried GBT? And uh, the, the insight there is that you should really just be using it for everything because it is a little bit of an alien technology mm -hmm. and it's not always super clear what it will perform well at. And so increasingly, if you just start to use it for a lot of stuff, you'll find out where it kind of like works for you. My most used behavior is I open the um, OpenAI chat GPT app and I babble into it and I just word vomit. And then I go, please write this up in a consistent way. <laughs> and then sometimes it's not even like what I actually uh, meant, but it's much better. And I'm like, okay, it wasn't what I meant, but this is better. Um, and what that does for me is like this thing I call first drafting, which is basically it gets thoughts out of the brain. And then, you know, I talked to GPT. I said, "Hey, please write this up a, as a, as an idea, and then um, draft an email to so and so that look at that could be explored." And so, a minute and a half of walking suddenly turned into something that would normally take me 25, 30 minutes to do. And I think for the recipient, it was also written then in a much clearer, structural way that that person would much easier uh, would be able to consume much yeah. easier. And so the way I guess I think about prompting is how do you make sure that you are creating something that is written in the condensest form but tailored appropriately to whatever is the recipient being an AI or yeah. human? You're also getting to one of my favorite techniques for writing, which is advice to write a shitty first draft. Like as quickly as possible, write, write, just get it out of your head, get it on paper, it can, you know, and don't stop, don't edit, don't, don't go back, don't, you know, any typos, whatever, just go. And then you can edit later. Uh, and the same thing for LMs, right? You know, I mean, like, uh, give me, uh, if you just say, like, give me a marketing campaign for Bark, what it'll give you is boring, right? But if you say, hey, you're now a 24-year-old marketing executive, you just moved from Nebraska mm -hmm. to New York City, this is your first job, and you're about to meet your boss that you really, really want to be, that you really want to impress. And what I need you to do is to come up with five ideas that uh, will allow us to celebrate um, Thanksgiving in a completely different ways that's really relevant to your peers. Yeah. That's going to give you a different output than give me a marketing yeah. campaign. And if you then say, okay, that's great. Now give me five ideas that is definitely illegal. <laughs> then you're going to get something completely different, right? You know, or stuff that will definitely get you fired. Yeah. Um, and so I, I do think that, yeah, 
working with your own originality to extract more original thought out of the LMM is the way yeah. to go. Back to things that can get you fired. I want to hear the story about you breaking into the studio at MTV Europe. <laughs> So I think it sounds a little bit more rock and roll now than it was at the time. I was young. I was mid early 20s and had just gotten an internship uh, working on MTV for MTV Europe, uh, which at the time had just had one feat that went to all channels in Europe. And um, I was writing my final thesis for my master's program. And so the bosses thought I was working a lot because <laughs> I was sitting there using the computer. And one of them came over and said, hey, you know, just started to chat because I was the only one in the office and learned that I had been very early on the precursor to the internet called FidoNet and that I used to, I created like an IS, uh, like a, these interactive magazines back in Denmark and uh, that I knew a lot about computers. And so he was like, you should come up with a show about this internet thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, hmm, wait a minute. So I, um, I came up with this thought that if you could take a camera and you can make the presenter look like a flash animation. You could then show websites and other animations and webcam requests in a TV environment, and it would look pretty. It would look pretty sweet. And so I um, uh, programmed this little thing where, from a computer, you could have people send user-generated content, and then you could make a what we would refer to as a clip and link show. So a clip of a presenter talking about something, and then a music video in the back. And so. I made it and I pitched it to my boss who thought it was somewhat cool. And then I started to pitch it to like engineering and a lot of other people. And they were like, this is no way. Like we're not gonna put like a, a hacky computer on air to all of Europe. So I thought at the time it would be an awesome idea to bribe the transmission engineer to go live from my office at two What'd in the morning. With? There's a show on a <laughs> bottle of whiskey, because uh, this was, the UK. And then I convinced one of the presenters, this guy Trey, that he should kind of be in on it. And then at two in the morning, we went live from, <laughs> from my office and we did an hour live TV. And uh, next morning I walked in, I was like, okay, I'm getting get fired for sure. I'll probably sued too. And so career's over, but at least I was at MTV and I did something pretty rock and roll. And uh, at one point, Brent, who was the president at the time, he, he emails me and said, Henrik, do you know anything about it? And I reply, I don't know anything about it. And he replies back something to the extent of like, don't ever pull a stunt like that again, but I want the show on air. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so uh, I went from being kind of like the, the intern to be the, I think it was called new, new media development mm -hmm. executive. Uh, and then from that, I ended up building a lot of other things and ended up running uh, the developing efforts in the in the 100 and 110 yeah. channels in 164 countries and 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 got That's my career amazing. And yeah, you definitely wouldn't have put it this way at the time but effectively you ran a signal mining test i ran a signal mining test for sure uh <laughs> no i've never, actually never thought about it but that is exactly what i did yeah. i love it you've advised a lot of corporates on how they can better innovate and i think a key question right now that a lot of them are figuring out is like, where should this AI thing sit? I'm curious for your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, like, I think it should sit wherever it can sit, because I think right now the biggest risk is that people don't do anything at all. Um, and so uh, wherever anybody wants yeah. to grab it. I have definitely drank the Kool-Aid, and so I think it is one of the most important things for companies to get their heads around. You have to take it serious, and you have to start doing it now and i think as senior management that you have to do it yourself yeah. like it's 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 not something you outsource to the innovation team or the legal team if you don't understand it uh, then it's a little bit like saying you don't understand business or you don't understand the internet um the overall framework that i'm thinking about is is people so how do i upgrade the capabilities of the people and that has two elements to it one is how do i make them not scared to use it that is by creating some internal policies and just communicate from the leadership, hey, this is okay that you use it, or, or it's okay you use it, but don't ever put customer data anywhere, whatever it can be. And then it's just giving people, uh, teach them, inspire them, all those different things. On the people side, I find that there are three types of people sitting in the organization. One is there's the one who 
uses it a lot, but don't tell anybody because they're scared that they are not allowed to do it or that they're scared that they have found a way of being super efficient and then somebody's just going to give them more work. Um, then there are the people who are super scared about it taking their job. And so they're just kind of like, I don't want to touch this. I, And then I think there's the rest that's heard about it has maybe tried to put their name into ChatGPT once and then haven't touched it again. And so I think these three different groups have to be different, dealt with in different ways. Then I have uh, what I call process. So I think that specifically in the interface between organizations, there's a lot of stuff that AI can do. So I'll give you an example. Um, we have a big design team and we have a big sales team. The designers would like briefs. The salespeople don't know how to write them. They are very good at talking though. So if you interview them or have a bot interview them, then they will talk for a long time. And the bot is very, very good at writing very specific documentation in a very specific way. And so they can write these briefs in a very good way. So these interfaces or how do you use AI to optimize processes, I think is very useful. And there I would simply hire somebody internally or externally, whoever you can find to kind of start to map those and start a great product. And the last thing is product, where I think a lot of people go naturally. But the issue is that the technology moves so fast. So if you are starting an 18-month project today, I'm like, GPT-5 is going to be around before that, and it's going to change everything. And so I find it actually to be pretty complicated to add core AI into it. So instead, what I'm doing right now with the organizations that I advise is that I look a little bit of where there's easy things that you can buy off the shelf. So... You want to make it easier for the customer service team, there's stuff you can buy after that. Or I try to look at what is data that I have internally that I just need to make sure that I start to collect in a way where I will be able to use it to some either tuning or foundational models so that as this become more of a agents talking yeah. to agents world, where is some of yeah. the unique stuff? This moment today in, in innovation and entrepreneurship, um, you know, the, the I, there are a lot of senior people out there right now uh, who are struggling a bit. You know, the VC market is kind of soft. The interest rates are up. Um, and AI is changing things in lots and lots of ways. I'm just curious, you know, how you're advising folks who come to you and they're, they're sort of looking for their next play. And are there a few trends that you've seen or, or ways that you're advising folks who are looking for, you know, the, the next thing in innovation and entrepreneurship? Yeah, there's a few things that kind of comes to mind. I think... Entrepreneurs obviously have an interesting career path because we often don't want to do what we just did. Like if you're a lawyer and you stop your job, the chances are you're looking for a new job as being a lawyer. And so it's relatively kind of easy to see that path. Most entrepreneurs, when they've done something in X space, they're like, I'm definitely never going to work mm -hmm. in that space again. Um, and I think there is a bunch of pressure on entrepreneurial folks to very fast come up with a narrative of what they're doing next. And so you get all these abstract kind of questions like, do you want to go back into building again? Do you want to be an investor? Do you want to go into corporate, whatever? And I think most of us are, honestly don't really know. And so this in between time, which I find uh, a lot of people, especially in the entrepreneurial class are having, uh, it's just a very vulnerable and interesting and beautiful and yeah. scary time because you kind of like need to figure out what your next thing is. Um, now, a few thoughts that have helped me at least over the years. One is I create these things I call micro moments. And so I'm very aware of places and times and moments where I'm in flow, where I just really have a good time. It could be because I giggle or because that I forget time or whatever it is. And I write these down. And so this could be walking over the Brooklyn Bridge to work. Just love that. Or being in specific, interesting brainstorms about why. And then I use that as a, a almost like a tool to when somebody suggests something to go like, oh, I wonder how many of, I, I wonder if I'm going to get a lot of these micro moments doing that. I think the second thing is, uh, and this I don't know how to say without just being the normal cliche, but I find if you f work with people you like, and you pursue with great intensity what you find to be interesting, it often leads you a good place, even if you don't know how to do that. Um, and so I'm greatly inspired by this book uh, written by Kenneth Stanley called Why Greatness Can't Be Planned, which is a book about AI. But 
he articulates basically that uh, there's this fallacy of the objective. Um, and if you really want to do something that is interesting and different and meaningful, you have to pursue interestingness and it creates this open-endedness system. And then basically the skull will take care of itself by pursuing interestingness. You will lay the stepping stone and it's going to lead you somewhere nice. I do get very, I'm then getting increasingly fascinating with this idea of soulfulness and humanity. And because for example, now with autos where we are looking for founders, one of the things that we're asking ourselves is like, so what is it that we're looking for them to do? And it's not writing the software and it's not writing the ad copy. Like in a lot of that stuff we can do better with AI. It is about human connectivity. It's the same thing now when you render an image of yourself, but sure if you tried it on like a, a photo studio setup where you kind of upload a bunch of your pictures and you say like, you know, render an image where I'm walking in a suit. And it looks like you, but it doesn't really, really look like there's yeah. something missing. Uh, and so that like, that element, that soul, mm -hmm. human, what nest, whatever it is, now, it might become just better, and then uh, that will be a soul problem. But I, that I, that's I find really fascinating yeah. right now. Yeah, no, there's there's a lot of uncanny valley situations happening right now. I don't know if you saw um, Lou Reed's widow has a Lou Reed bot that she talks to. Have you seen this already? Have you read about this? No. So, Lou Reed's widow. She talks to talks to Lou Reed. And he passed on a couple of years ago, and she she knows it's not him, and she's said like I'm st I'm totally addicted to it, like I can't I can't stop, but like I and I know it's not him. I mean, like I think that'll happen. I'll give you another mind bender, and I think this kind of talked to all this uh, ethics stuff. I helped a fertility clinic uh, do some work on AI, and one of the questions that we had was that obviously for people who don't know their dad, and and the dad doesn't want to be known. Um, Will we allow, should we allow the kids to talk to a AI version of their dad so they can ask some of those questions without having the direct uh, relationship? And I honestly don't know the answer. Like, it sounds weird and creepy first, mm -hmm. but then you're like, hey, but you know, I'm sure you have a lot of questions that you'd like to get answered. This was your only option, would you just do it? And, and so, yeah. I mean, like talking to your dad spouse I love my wife so much that I know that if she passed, I would definitely do it because I will just kind of want to do whatever I could to kind of have a little bit of, of her in my life. And, and I, uh, yeah, yeah. I, it's fascinating. It is. Yeah. Henrik, thank you so much. Of course. I love this. That's Henrik Wordlin. I'm Dan Blumberg, and this is Crafted. Crafted is brought to you in partnership with Docker, which helps developers build, share, run, and verify applications anywhere without environment confirmation or management. More than 20 million developers worldwide use Docker's suite of development tools, services, and automations to accelerate the delivery of secure applications. Learn more at docker.com. Special thanks to Artium, where I launched Crafted to see how Artium can help you build your future at artium.ai. And Crafted is produced by Modern Product Minds, where my team and I can help you take a new product from zero to one and beyond. We specialize in early stage product discovery, growth, and experimentation. Learn more and sign up for the Crafted newsletter at modernproductminds.com. And somehow, someway, please share Crafted with a friend. Don't ever pull a stun like that again, but I want the show on air. Mm -hmm.